Hello, everyone. When Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What was he thinking? What was on Peter's mind? What did all that mean to Peter? When Jesus asked the Pharisees, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they immediately answered, son of David. They didn't really even have to think about that one. It was a given. Every Jew knew that the coming Messiah was a son of David. And that all goes back to a promise God had made to David concerning his descendant. Very, very, very important promise God made to David. It's important in, in our whole understanding of the Bible. Have you ever noticed that the New Testament writers even on the surface of it, seem to refer to the Messiah as the King of the Jews, as the Son of God, as the Messiah, in a way that it appears, right, even on the surface of it, that they know that all these titles are referring to the same person. And it's a given fact that the Messiah will be the King of the Jews, he will be a son of God, etc., etc., as well as a son of David. I, I've read theological um, articles um, related to that, and, and it's interesting that it seems like a lot of people don't understand why that's true. But it's, it's really very, very simple. And so I want to go over some of that in this video. And sort of demonstrate to you how this promise to David that God made concerning his descendant is so vitally important to understand if you really want to understand who Jesus was. So let's start with some background information. The English word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos. The English word Christ in your Bible is not a translated word. In other words, in English, it doesn't really mean anything. It, it, it's more like a name to English readers, but it isn't a name. It's a title. And the English word Christ is an anglicized word. What does that mean? Well, all it really means is that you take a word from another language and you spell it in a way that sounds more English. So you take the Greek word Christos and you spell it in a way that sounds more like an English speaker would say the same thing, Christ. It's just really a respelling of a word from another language. So as you can see, it's not actually translated. It's just spelled differently. The word Christos, the Greek word, when translated means anointed or anointed one. So if you saw this word in the Greek language and you were a Greek speaker reading the Greek language and you saw this word, this is what you'd be thinking. An the anointed one. In other words, the way to say Christos in English is anointed one. The very same thing is true 
with the, in, uh, the, the Hebrew word Mashiach. The Hebrew word Mashiach is where we get our English word Messiah. And again, the word Messiah is just an anglicized word. It's not translated. And just like the Greek word, it means anointed one. And so here's a little table that really maps that out. You take the Hebrew word Mashiach, and if you just anglicize it, spell it like an English person would, would want to say it, it would be Messiah. But when you translate it, it really means anointed one. And the same thing happens with the Greek word Christos. And so in our Bibles, when we say, or when we see an expression like Jesus the Christ or Jesus the Messiah, it means Jesus the Anointed One. So if our Bibles had translated this word, that's what we'd see, Jesus the Anointed One. And so when Peter uh, said these words to Jesus, you were the Christ, the Son of the Living God, you were the Messiah, the Son of the Living God, would be the same thing. And it would mean you are the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. One place where you can, you can see that more clearly is at Acts 4.26, quoting Psalm 2.2. In some Bibles, some translations, you'll have the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. Others, one other that I know of, the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah, NRSV. And some other translations have the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Okay. So they, they translate it a little bit, or they you really can't call it a translation, I guess, if it's Christ or Messiah put here. But some translations will elect to translate this word at Acts 4.26. Hopefully that can make it really clear to you what's really going on here. And the reason they're doing this here is because if you go back and read Psalm 2, it sounds like these words are about David. So a lot of translators find it more palatable to have David being called God's anointed rather than God's Christ. And so you can see how um, not translating this word can kind of obscure things in the Bible. And that will become a little bit more clear why I'm saying that in a second here. The King Messiah of the Jews, the Davidic King, was God's Christ, God's King, God's Son. King David was God's Christ, God's King, and God's Son. David and Solomon. This was true of both of them. They were God's Christ because they were God's anointed. These kings of Israel were God's anointed. They were God's king because they were God's chosen king for the people of Israel. But the scripture uses the language that the king of Israel was God's king because God chose that king. And we'll see a verse in a minute here that makes it very clear that the Davidic king was considered to be God's son. So let's start with this promise to David that God had made. The Lord, or Yahweh, also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. 
When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Really important promise that God had made to David. At 1 Samuel chapter 8, you can read about how Israel had rejected God as their king. When God delivered Israel out of Egypt, he was their king. There was no human king. And God would raise up judges to judge over Israel and deliver, deliver Israel from their enemies. And the prophet Samuel was one of these judges. But in the days of Samuel, the Israelites said, well, we don't want this anymore. We want a human king, just like all the other nations have. And we want a human king to judge us and go before us in battle. So they don't want to be ruled by judges anymore, or ruled by God as king through these judges, rather. They wanted a human king. And so God gave them over to their desires, and he gave them Saul. That didn't turn out too good. Too good. So God chose David, a young shepherd boy, a man after his own heart, to be the anointed king of Israel, his Christ. And if you look at the promise here, David's descendant, um, will have the throne of his kingdom forever. And God says to David, Your kingdom shall endure before me forever. David's kingdom. And this is really important because when you read about how David's tent had fallen, it's referring back to this promise. Your throne shall be established forever. And another thing that's important that is said in this promise by God is he says, I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. Now what's interesting about this is how David refers this promise about his descendant to Solomon. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And Solomon did that, didn't he? He built the temple. David said to Solomon, My son, I had intended to build a house to the name of the Lord my God, but the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed much blood on the earth before me. Behold, a son will be born to you, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from his, all his enemies on every side. For his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, the Lord be with you, that you may be successful and build the house of the Lord your God, just as he has spoken concerning you. So David applies this promise to his son Solomon. It's important to remember or to observe that this promise was conditional. It was conditional upon the king being obedient to the law of God. And Solomon in his later days, he had many wives, and as many wives were, some of, at least some of his wives were foreign wives, they turned into other gods, and Solomon worshipped other gods later in life, including the god Moloch. And that was the beginning of the fall of the Davidic kingdom. Notice here how this promise, he shall be my son and I will be his father, refers to Solomon, God's son, Solomon. Think about that. 
And again, at First Chronicles 28, 5-6, Of all of my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord, the kingdom of Yahweh over Israel. Notice what it says here. Solomon is going to sit on the kingdom of God. Also take a look at First Chronicles 29, 23. He said to me, Your son Solomon is the one who will build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be a son to me, and I will be a father to him. So Solomon is going to sit on the throne of this kingdom. And the throne is called the throne of the kingdom of God, or the throne of God, because God was supposed to be the king of Israel. But now they wanted this human king. And so what's happening is, is that God's kingly authority is being delegated to a human being. And that's what it means um, to say that Solomon sat on the throne of God. He had this authority that God had over Israel. He's um, executing Yahweh's authority over Israel as king. Because really, God was supposed to be their king. So God anoints these Davidic kings with his spirit to rule over Israel. Saul, David, Solomon. In fact, Isaiah 45.1 says that God anointed King Cyrus of Persia. God's Christ. Cyrus is called God's anointed, God's Christ, God's Messiah. Your son Solomon, I have chosen him to be a son to me, and I will be a father to him. Solomon, God's son. So, in the Bible, you see this phenomenon occurring many times, where you have this thing which many people call dual prophecy with a near and far fulfillment. And that's because, to the New Testament writers, the law was a shadow. It was a shadow of Christ. As Paul says in Colossians 2, you know, the law was a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. So the law was like, you know, when you're outside and your body cast a shadow, but the substance of that body was Jesus Christ himself. Jesus was the full fulfillment of of all of this. So the New Testament writers regarded their history under the law as a foreshadowing of Christ, and that's true with the temple. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, for example, Paul says, all these things were written as a typology, as an example for us in these last days. So you have this thing that many people call dual prophecy, and here are a number of them. 2 Samuel 7, 11 and 14, the promise we just looked at to David, fulfilled in Solomon, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Exodus 4, 22 to 23, not really a prophecy, but the same kind of idea. Israel is called um, God's firstborn son, like Jesus. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 18, God promises to raise up a prophet, and God says, I will put my words in his mouth. Well, you'll see some people saying, well, that was Joshua. That's true. But Peter tells us in Acts 3, it's Jesus. And that's because the law foreshadowed the things to come. And it was Joshua who led them into the promised land, wasn't it? Like Jesus. And in fact, the name Joshua and Jesus is the same name. It's just that when it came out in English Bibles, um, because Joshua was was uh, anglicized from the Hebrew, and the name Jesus was anglicized from the Greek, they came out different, but they're really the same name. For example, if you read the Greek Old Testament, you'll see Jesus for Joshua, and Jesus in the New Testament for Jesus. Jesus. 
Isaiah 7.14, Emmanuel, near, far, dual fulfillment. That promise of that child being born was a sign to King Ahaz that the two kings that were currently attacking him would be gone before this child, Emmanuel, grows up. So there had to be some child born during the days of King Ahaz. And I didn't put a name down here because people debate who that child was. Some scholars think it was Hezekiah, others think it wasn't. But Matthew says this is fulfilled in Jesus, Matthew 1.23. Even though that child had to be born during the days of King Ahaz, was that child born, born during the days of King Ahaz, Almighty God? No. It was a sign to King Ahaz that God would be with Israel in plan and purpose. In fact, it tells you that. And it means the same thing at Matthew 1.23. God was with Israel in giving them this human Savior, Jesus. Same kind of thing happens at Isaiah 9.6. Um, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, God's Messiah. And although that verse is not quoted in the New Testament, um, the verses just before it are quoted in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 4. Isaiah 42, 1 and following, Israel and Jesus, Matthew 12, 18. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. You'll see Jews and Christians debating, well, is this about Jesus or is this about Israel? It, it's not like that. It's both. It's about Israel and Jesus. In Isaiah, especially starting about chapter 42, Isaiah typifies the people of Israel like a single person. He does that for several chapters. And he calls Israel Jacob, and he talks about the nation of Israel like Israel's this single man, Jacob. And that's because Jacob's other name was Israel, and that's how Israel got their name. That's one reason, anyway. Jesus was the king of Israel. And that's why this can be so easily applied to him. He died for his people, Israel. He was the head of the body of people known as Israel. They were his subjects. He was the king, and as, king, as the king, he was their subjects. And that's one reason he could die for them. He was their king. And you have to understand ancient thought. What was ever true of the king was true of the people. And so as the head of the body, as their king, you know, he's dying for all those people, so his death is effective for all the people of Israel. And that's another reason why these things can be true of Jesus and Israel. He's the king of Israel. Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt I called my son. Well, if you check Hosea 11.1, 1, that's about Israel. If you check Matthew 2.15, Matthew's saying this is about Jesus. Well, he's the king of the Jews. That's what Matthew is talking about. He's the king of this nation. So that's just a brief description of this dual prophecy thing that happens in Scripture. And that's what's happening with God's promise to David. As we see in the New Testament... This applies to Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. So it's right there. It's right there that Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of God's promise to David to sit on his throne, David's throne, which is the throne of God, forever, and his kingdom will have no end. By the way, when you see the word reign in the Bible, it's like a verb form of the word king. We don't do that in English. We don't say, you know, David kinged 
over Israel. We have to say he reigned. But in Hebrew and Greek, um, it's like king is, there's a verb form for the word king. And so when you see that word reign, think king in a, in a verb sense. He's kinging, you know, kinging over Israel. The throne of his father David. And again, on the day of Pentecost, Peter says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. He's telling you there that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to David. He's, he's telling you that outright. God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. And he's about to tell you how this happened. God seated Jesus at his right hand when he raised him from the dead. And at Hebrews 1.5, for to which of the angels did he ever say, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me? Quoting 2 Samuel 7.14. Do you see how that was true of Solomon? But it's really perfectly and ultimately true of Jesus. And so you have this parallelism here. David and Solomon were God's Christ. God's anointed, God's king, that is God's choice of king, and God's son. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And there's, there's, there's a bunch more verses I didn't mention in this video, where this, this whole sonship idea, there's verses where that applies to David as well. For example, Psalm 89, I will call him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. This is probably the most important framework that we can have to start building a picture of who Jesus is. This Davidic promise, the idea that David was God's Christ, God's Messiah, God's anointed one. If you read it in the Greek text, it'll say, you know, regarding David, that he's God's Christos, God's Christ. If you read it in the Hebrew, he's God's Mashiach, or God's Messiah. And then the Davidic king is a son to God, and God is a father to him, just like Jesus. And when you see that framework, you can see how... You know, the Pharisees, it was so easy for them to answer that question to Jesus. He's David's son. And they expected the Messiah to be like David because of the promise God gave to David. He will sit on the throne over the kingdom. The kingdom of Israel was the kingdom of God. That's the terminology that was being used um, of Israel during the days of David and Solomon, until Solomon went after other gods, and then David's tent had fallen, etc., etc. And if you read through that history, there's a continual degeneration after Solomon. And at Acts 1 6, the disciples say to Jesus, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They have this on their mind the Davidic kingdom. And on the day of Pentecost, you see how Peter is talking about this same thing. This is probably the most important framework to use as a starting point to answer that question, who is Jesus? You know, who is the Messiah? He's got to be like David. In fact, the Bible... <laughs> speaks about the coming Messiah like it's David himself. David will rise again to shepherd the flock. It uses language like that. And that's because it's David's descendant that is going to make all this happen. And so you have that picture 
you know, the, and we have to start, in order to understand the Bible, what would a Jewish person of the first century be thinking when he's seen all this language we see in the Bible? What was Peter thinking when he said, you were the Messiah, the Son of the living God? He would have had this in his, on his mind. King David was God's Messiah, God's Christ, his anointed one. He was the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, like Jesus. Remember the sign over Jesus' head when he died. He was a son to God, and God was a father to the Davidic king. Jesus was a prophet. David was a prophet. And David was also kind of like a priest king, like Melchizedek. There's a little more to say about that. I'll, I'll leave that in this video, just to keep it short. But you have to really appreciate where, where all this is coming from, from a Jewish perspective. If you're a Jew in the first century and you're, you're awaiting this coming Messiah, this descendant of David, you're expecting this Messiah to be like David. And that's why a lot of the Jews, you know, they wanted the Messiah. They wanted, they were basically expecting Jesus to go beat up the Romans, just like David went and beat up the Philistines. And he saved them. He was a savior in that way for Israel against the enemies, the Philistines. So it's the same pattern, Christ and David. Except that God, as he always does, raises things up a little higher than men even expect. Even though Solomon had failed God by disobeying him and going after other gods, God always keeps his promise. He, he works everything toward the good, no despite what men do. And he fulfilled this promise in Jesus. And he raised him up to sit on the throne of God, like David had, but in a much higher way. He sits at the right hand of God in the heavenlies, not just as king over Israel, but as the king over all the nations of the earth. King of all other kings. Kings of all the kings of the earth. Or a king of all the kings of the earth. This pattern of King David and Solomon really really important to understand and when you when you when you really start to see this clearly you, you can see why Trinitarian theologians don't really want to talk about this because when you start seeing this clearly the Trinity will start to fall apart before your eyes so I really encourage you to take a look at all these things concerning King David and how David's identity as God's Christ, his anointed king, and this sonship idea was why the Jews expected the coming Messiah to be these things, because David was those things. God bless you.